The truth is, adding value will never go out of style. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another Five Things podcast today. I've got a, a kind of a special guest for me, um, longtime friend. We've known each other about 16 years, and uh, uh, Mike Ruck, very successful entrepreneur, self-started business guy. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. I'm glad to be here, man. I'm yeah. excited. And, uh, you know, for, for those of you who may not know Mike, um, as many of you may not at this point, but uh, Mike grew up in Pennsylvania. And uh, tell us a little bit about the way you grew up and your whole family is a, a bunch of characters. I mean, you, you've you always been one of these guys. I've always said it like you should have your own cartoon. Like you're this you're this wide open cartoon character. Well, shit, house. I got my own reality show. So. Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> but that's why, because you that it's your personality. But uh, so Pennsylvania, grown up in Pennsylvania. Uh, no, I actually grew up, my dad worked for the government, worked for the FAA. So I lived in Alaska, Guam, Hawaii. I don't even know if you know all this, know. Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, and then Long Island, and then we moved to PA. And when I was in eighth grade, but up to eighth grade, I was in average more than a school a year. Mm. Just so I always had to make fast friends. And I had five brothers and sisters. We were six years apart. So some of them made friends, some of them didn't. I never had a problem. Some of my sisters and my brother had problems with it. So it was, we became friends. Um, so uh, family, right? six, five, six of us total. Mom yeah. and dad were had a little selfish streak to them. They loved each other, but us six kids, you know, we found ourselves kind of just figuring it out. <laughs> I'll never forget when I was 13, I, I was going to school and I was like, Mom, I need an outfit for school. It's first day. And she's like, well, you've been cutting grass. I'm like, so I'm buying my own shit now? You know, so since I was 13, I've been buying my own food, my own clothes. And I didn't know that. You know, one of the things I talked to is because I started off in a similar way. It's like growing up, single mom, no money. And I, I kind of knew she didn't have money, but it was like if I wanted that guest jean jacket, I didn't feel comfortable asking my mom. Like I had hustling baseball cards, doing stuff like that. I think a lot of business owners grow up like that, to be honest. Well, you know, for me, like Christmas was you got an outfit. That was your Christmas gift. So when you went to school, all the kids would have different outfits. Me, my brothers and sisters, we wore one on Monday, one on Tuesday, and the same on Wednesday, you know, and you just went back and forth and mom would wash it, you know. So I would always be sensitive to what other fuckers had, mm -hmm. you know, but I never really needed it. Do you think that made you more driven? I would say driven because I didn't want that stuff. I found it silly, but but taking care of myself, I would say made me driven. You know, like when yeah. I went to college, I didn't want to owe anything when I got out, so I had to work through college. And my three older babies, I mean, made them work full-time jobs even though I was a wealthy guy because it, it defined me, so they. Wait a minute. You, you went to college and didn't have to borrow money. Uh uh. So I waited. I wait bar. I I bartended and I waited on tables. I made eight hundred dollars a week. College was six grand a year, so eight hundred a week's forty. I didn't at the back then. You didn't pay taxes on tips. So not only did I pay college, I was taking down you know whatever I wanted to do in life, whether right. it be date girls or go out to bars. And so I enjoyed the shit out of the whole. So it is possible to get through college without getting it for free from the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, not only did I pay my way through college, when I married my wife at the college, I inherited her college debt and I had enough money saved through college. I paid her debt off, right. you know, just because I didn't want any debt. Right. Well, just kind of a side note, I, I earned college in the military as well because I grew up pretty, pretty poor, basically. And, uh, you know, went in the military to get my college money and got screwed out of it, by the way, because uh, you got to use it within 10 years. And I didn't know that until. Well, you missed that memo. That would have been your fault, Brian. Yeah, that is my fault. Actually, it is sure my the fault. Government, I'm sure the government had it very detailed what you needed to do. I'm sure there was 58 pages that I signed when I, <laughs> as a 17 year old kid, I agree with you. But, you know, tr truth be told, that was my fault. It's my fault. And so while I feel like I got screwed out of it, I still have ownership in that because that was my fucking fault. I didn't look at the details. You know, I, I have over a thousand people that work for me and they say to me all the time, like, Mr. Mike, Mr. Mike, man, I got in here on time today. Thank you. I'm to giving you $20 an hour. You're <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're supposed to be here. Mr. Mike, Mr. Mike, man, I never take a break when I'm not supposed to. Well, that, I appreciate that. That's really kind of you because we don't, pay for you to go to break when it's not break time. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, everybody's sitting there wanting credit for what they're supposed to do. Well, that's a Chris Rock saying, right? 
you, you know, remember the Chris rocks. People always want credit for something they're supposed to. I don't, I pay for my kids. 17. I would have, you were my boy. I would, and then 27, you said, man, I lost my, my, my money. I'd be like, now whose fault is that Brian? There's no way that's the government's fault. That's your fault. Now the government probably made it so taxing that a 17 year old boy would say, screw this. I'm not doing all this work. You know what I mean? Well, ultimately what it was is there was some criteria, some fine print in the contract that I agreed to. And so I didn't know it, but the ignorance doesn't make me, uh, it, it does, it doesn't give me an out. It was still, I didn't know. And that's on me to an well, extent. I mean, you know, for every entrepreneur, you know, that's, that's the kicker right there. Well, like, well, and, but it's all on you, baby, you know, so you got to figure it out. Maybe, yes. maybe listen to a podcast and learn some shit. But most of the time you're just getting out of bed and going, Whoo. you know, like I remember when I sold my business. The, the board guy said, what was board meetings like before we sold? Well, I said, well, first off, you find seven gentlemen. This is kind. My board meeting was going in the bathroom, look in the mirror and go, what the hell are you going to do today, bro? You fucking man up. <laughs> <laughs> you need to man up. <laughs> um, so, so you're growing up in Pennsylvania. Do you, you consider yourself naturally extroverted, extroverted or? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, I used to say no. Because I hated talking in a big room, but like a room like this or a sales call, yeah, or or party where I know people. But now I don't like really just getting out and going to a restaurant and going meeting some folks, mm -hmm. you know. But that's probably more just like I'm wondering why they don't want to be me. Well, I would say just looking back. I, I mean, you're a you're such an outgoing. You never meet a stranger. You're good to talk to anybody. So I, I would say you're more extroverted, whereas I'm more naturally introverted. Um, so I think there gives, it gives hope, you know, regardless of your personality, y you can shift. You know, I had five schools in six years and I think that was a good thing for me growing up, uh, because it, I was naturally introverted. I can sit in the, the, I can sit in the corner of the room and just have a con and just literally just have a glass of wine or a cocktail and people watch and I'm totally comfortable. It's very natural for me, but I've also learned over the years to switch the gear and try to be that extroverted guy when well, I need to. I, I, I find introverted guys, my, all three of my older babies are all introverts, you know, and uh, it, we raised them in a bubble. We, you know, we, we basically fed them by a spoon until they were 16. And I was like, I'm wondering to myself, like, what the hell is wrong with these kids? I raised a bunch of pusses. And uh, so what I made them all do is wait on tables. Every single, all three of them had to wait on tables through high school and college. And, and all, I wouldn't say they're kind of like you, but they, Today, they would say they're introverted, but they go in a room, they're talking to everybody. Their daddy, who's extroverted, sitting in the corner on the, on the couch drinking a cocktail. You know, so they've learned to talk, you know, and I think those skills of being a bartender or a waiter, it takes you out of that comfort zone that you want, you know. So you grew up in Pennsylvania primarily. Once you, once you settled down a little bit, you end up going to college. I went to college uh, to be a, I was a finance major. I wanted to be a Gordon Gecko. 86, you know, I was 16 when Wall Street came out and I want to go on uh, Manhattan and, and my, my buddy Bill, same deal. We both practically got a perfect score on our math SATs. We thought we were smart guys. He went to University of Pittsburgh. I went to Millersville in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Bill came out, went to Wall Street and was a bond trader. I went to go work in a mobile home in, in the woods. <laughs> so mobile home in the woods with, uh, was it 84 lumber, if I'm not mistaken? No, a different... So I always think about 84 lumber for some reason. Yeah. So when I went to college, I, I, I worked full time as a bartender and a waiter. When I graduated my senior year, I took my series sevens license to be a stockbroker and I was sponsored for another phone. So I was waiting on tables, but I was doing 20 hours at the, I never went to class. I literally never went to class, got 18 C's my last 18 classes. But, um, when I graduated, I went to work at a stock company. And my first day at work was at a company called Hill, uh, Hibbard and Brown. They since all been arrested and indicted, but this is back in 93. And I was working that day and they're making me cold call. And I landed a, a guy, my first day at work mm -hmm. that night, I was waiting on tables and the guy that owned the restaurant was an executive at this forest products company called universal forest products. Okay. So the, he hired me on the spot and offered me a job and a car in Salisbury, North Carolina. So I took the job and gave up being a stockbroker. So that company built their business on your back. Well, they were a billion dollar company when I met them, but, but so I that's a little jab to the yeah, narrative. Yeah, yeah. But I, now I did become salesman of the year in five years, we'll talk about the us. young, the younger, younger than 20 years in any other, uh, so, and then I took all my business, started my own company and 
thanked him for that. Mike's got a great sock story. We're not going to go. Into <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> it's not. Um, so one of the things I like joking about is this narrative that, you know, companies build their backs on their employees. And while obviously a company needs employees, um, it's not a uh, it's not a negative to the 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 employee i mean you're you're going to win if you're doing a good job you know a company's job is to retain their good people and uh you know so this this kind of that victim mentality out there to where it's like this this corporation's you know getting rich off our back it's like you know they didn't come pull you out of your apartment to and force you to go to work like you interviewed and so with your first company um you obviously learned a lot of foundational skills that have helped you through your whole life. Well, yes. Now, when I started my company in, I guess I was 28, it was 1998, no, 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 maybe, uh, yeah, 1998, I started my business up and I worked for a, a billion dollar company. The first order that went out, I was paralyzed because my customer wouldn't pay for it. I'm like, why, Mr. Customer, will you not pay for this? And well, you have no proof of delivery. And I'm like, well, what's that? I was working for five years, salesman of the year for a billion dollar company. And when I started my own company, I didn't know what a proof of delivery was. I didn't know so many things of fundamental business because I was just a, a piece, a piece of, of a big machine. Right. So now all of a sudden I'm carrying it myself. I mean, I learned so much shit in the first six months. You know, I would get, I'd get shingles on the side of my head. I couldn't even see out of my eye because I was working around the clock. Just, it, well, it was stress, but it was also just this willingness to go. A proof of delivery. I would go home to my wife and I said, could you know that they won't pay a bill unless you can prove you gave it to them? She's like, well, that's how it works in this house, Mike. I'm like, I understand, man. This shit's cool. So I know if I do a, this proof of delivery, I get paid. So that's cool. You know, so that's how I live my life. So, you know, there's a tip in there. When you start a business, you're responsible for the things you don't know and the things you know, you know, so. Uh, and then a lot of times we're responsible for stuff that has nothing to do with us, you know, but it's just, you want to take care of the client. When you talk about an employee, I, I'm an investment banker uh, ever since I sold my business, but I invest in smaller companies, you know, it's so like I got a flooring company that's like $40 million when I bought it. Now we're doing 80. But what I like about a smaller company is you can build a team. You can actually make this employee. I wouldn't say bend to you, but like what I tell everybody is, man, I've got a job. I got a vision. I want to, I'm curious to what you have to say, but this small company, I really, I really think I know because I know how to run this small type of business. And then I want you to participate and I'm going to give you $60,000 to do that. And then, you know, the plant starts at seven. We go to work. You show up at seven Oh five. That's a problem. Cause I paid you to be here at seven, you know? So I look at employees, you know, the back of the employee, I'm actually kind of opposite a little bit, Brian. I feel like, there is a bit of a burden for that employee. I mean, I got an expectation I want to meet. I, sure. The market the market calls for 60 grand. I'm willing to pay 60 grand. Okay. You know, like our, our videographer, I mean, he's got a fee that he wants and he says this is the number. And now that he's, I paid it, I have expectations. Absolutely. Is that fair? You know? Well, it is. It's a trade. It's barter. It's capitalism at, at its best. You know, it's, it's we agree on a rate or price and we agree on an expectation that you're going to provide X amount of work for this company and we're going to make sure that check direct deposits every two weeks or every week or whatever the it's a good trade-off you know my i have um i have three adopted babies under two and a half and i've got staff like you know i'm 51 years old my wife says you know i married a younger woman that's like the success you know jing like i got that check mark mm -hmm. she said i wanted babies i said I'll, I'll get babies but i want staff so well now with the staff there's more personalities in my house i mean i got three different people that come in this home and they you know they're like mr mike do you want us to do for you at the detriment of these babies? Like all three of these girls, like confront me. I was like, give me an example. Like what's bothering you? Like the whole turn the label forward in your fridge. I said, well, it's, it's a lean manufacturing thing. Like you're upset because I had two rows of Coors Light. It took three. You didn't work. You worked Monday and came back Wednesday. On Tuesday night, I ran out of Coors Light. If you anticipated my usage and filled my fridge the proper way, we wouldn't all be upset right now. But I'm upset that a Tuesday night at nine o'clock, I went for my last Coors Light and it wasn't there. She's like, well, you drank one of I'm like, no, no, I drink the same amount every night. You get the chance tomorrow to redo this job. But they're putting it on me, but I'm sitting there paying them. I was out of Coors Light. That's a problem. Right. Well, that's part of the expectation is 
I mean, that's part of the gig. Well, Make sure there's beer. The one girl, uh, Mona, I don't know her real name. I nickname them all. Yeah. I'm like, Mona, Mona said, but why the logo out front on your water? I go, well, I do it on the water because I want it on the Coors Light. The Coors Light, I want to make sure it's blue. That's why I want it out front. I'm not being a, I'm not being a slave driver here. They put blue on there for a reason. I'm curious. You know what I'm saying? So am I a bad boss? As, as long as there's an expectation, I mean, it's reasonable. You know? I send everybody a picture of my fridge of my companies. Three companies I own when I'm in the manufacturing, they got a, they got junk in a corner of the room. And I'm like, hey, if this was your home, would you allow that in the corner of your room? Like, no, but Mr. Mike, you, you're just so anal about everything. Like, what do you iron your underwear? I go, well, I don't wear any, but, but I'll show you my fridge. I show my fridge and like, damn, what does your bathroom look like? And I go, you want to know? So my girls have to have the toilet paper stacked up. Not too much because I don't want it to fall on me, but enough that I never run out of toilet paper because that's a bad day. That's how business is. I mean, if you really think about business, it's, it's, it's all about making sure you have the goods mm -hmm. to take care of the customer. And not too many goods, not too little goods, but in your own household, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good point. And so as an employee, that narrative really drives me crazy. It's, it's kind of a, a negative thing for me when I think about it. Cause it's just, to me, it's such a victim mentality. It's, it's such, honestly, if I'm being real honest, it's kind of a loser mentality. It's like capitalism and they're, they're making, they're making all the money on our backs. Like, man, you, you went and interviewed there. I mean, they, they didn't pull you out of your trailer. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, well, I'll give you it, an example. When Black Lives Matter was, was going on, you know, and I have, I have two black children, sure. you know, and uh, my employees don't even know that. But I could pull up to one of my factories and it's 915 breaks from 9 to 910. Mm -hmm. And I have these two uh, black fellas sitting there and, and he's like, Mr. Mike, man, how long have I been working? I'm like, 10 years, bro. His name is Tyrone. The other one, his name is William. I'm like, you guys remember my best guys. I'm like, man, what do you think about this Black Lives Matter? I'm like, well, be honest with you. You know, I came in the factory last week and uh, John got arrested in my factory. The cops put their knee in his back over child support payments. So I went to the sheriff and I said, hey, man, this is my best employee. He's like, yeah, but he ain't paying his child support payments. So they're like, we knew we had our back. You know, I'm like, well, because it's wrong, guys. I said, but what else is wrong? Break was over at 910. We've been talking. It's 925. You brothers need to get back to work because I pay you to be here. But you know what I mean? Everybody's just wanting to take time. And sure. my time is worth too much damn money. It's uh, it's something that I, th I think it's easy to miss when you're an employee. I know I probably did growing up, but, you know, I've, I've been in scenarios where I'm talking to two or three people at the company and we just start talking about this and that. Instantly, sometimes I go to like, that just cost me like 10 bucks. This little football, football conversation. I call it stealing from me. And, I mean, I and can see people that. get pissed at me and I'm like, hey, dude, if you're going to steal from me, just make it more, you know, my wallet's right over there. They're like, how am I stealing from you? I'm like, you're on the clock. I'm paying you $20 an hour. And I've watched you screw around at the water cooler for the last 15 minutes. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I truly feel in my core, they're stealing from me. Well, and I think it's easy to say, like, I've used this analogy before. You, you hire someone to clean your house and you tell them you're going to pay them 25 bucks an hour to clean your house, right? And then they come over and they're they're sitting on the couch watching TV. I mean, you're going to lose your mind. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm paying you. You know, it's the same thing. I, I tell everybody in business, all my employees, I said, just do what you want to do at your home. But most importantly, when you're driving to work, all these great thoughts of what you're going to do to kill your debt. Do that for me. Don't do it when you walk in the door, because when you walk in the door, you, you go to shit. But do what you're driving like. So when you're driving to work, it's probably one of your best moments. You got a 15 minute drive, and you know, I'm going to come in. I'm going to talk to Michael on a podcast, sell some security jobs. And then you come in here, and Tom says, "The bank called. They're calling our loans. It's this customer, you know what I mean, or whatever the case yeah. may be." And then everything just breaks down, and all these good thoughts you had on your way to work don't happen. Almost every day. Every every day. But the yeah. beautiful thing about business, and it, every, I don't care what business you are. Whatever you were doing today is going to be happening tomorrow. Nothing new. Right. No, no. There might be a couple of fire drills. The exact same shit you did yesterday. You get to reinvent yourself tomorrow. So that's how I look at life. You know, I think business. I've, I've said this several times. Like I feel like you know when Neo in the the Matrix when he bends backward and he's dodging the bullets. I, I think that's how it is being a business owner. Like you walk in the door and you're just you're dodging bullets all. But but at some point you got to go to guns.
Well, yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I tell my guys all the time. I'm like, you guys are dodging this shit all the time, but we got to go to guns, man. We got a big account. It's time to roll. It's time to roll. Yeah. So that's what I would say. I guarantee at some point Keanu Reeves went to guns. Oh, he did. He definitely did. Um, So the one point before we move off the topic was talked about how kind of this victim victim mentality that corporations are robbing people of their life or something. You know, you started out as an employee and you you learned a great set of skills. You learned an industry and you you not only got paid well because you performed well, but you took that experience and a lot of that things you learned and you started your own business. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, when I was at, industri- at Universal Forest Products before I started Industrial Timber, mm-hmm. I was a young guy. I was working in this business and they wanted they were growing a new division. And they put me as one of five young sales guys around the country. Well, this big billion dollar company didn't even know what the hell they were doing. Sorry, I was thinking about the socks. (laughs) So, so I was sitting there, you know, trying to figure it out, like working for them to try to succeed. Before I knew it, after five years of working it out, not only did I become salesman of the years, I had my own vendors, my own customers, and I went. I had no money. Sure. So I'm like, how the hell do I start this some bitch? So I went to my customers and asked them to pay me COD. And I went to my vendors and got, got extended terms. I never borrowed a dime. I did it all on float. But it was survival. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that that learning of cash flow, you know, and that's really what business is. Like a lot of people don't think of it. They say you 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 like if one thing I learned, like in India, they have all these these um, shops, and they're all selling the same crap. You ever go somewhere in your life where they, you go to the, the Jamaica? The bazaar, and they're yeah, all, yeah, they're all selling the exact same crap. Right. But there's one booth at that place that is making more money than any other booth there. But they're all selling the same shit, all for a dime. Right. But for whatever reason, this person is selling more. And you know, when I went there, the girl goes, "Velocity, more shit, cash." And I'm like, man, something so simple. So I said to my employees all the time, just velocity, man. Just turn my cash. If I sell something to them, he says he's going to pay in 10 days. I just want to be paid in 10 days. If I negotiate with a vendor and I'm going to say, I'm going to pay you in 30, I'm going to pay you in 30, but don't call me at 25. Right. You know what I mean? So what you're saying is basically if you get into business for yourself, cash flow is, is you got to pay attention to that. Well, I think, I think everybody that starts a business, the first thing they do is they, they sit in the show. They come up with an idea, they're on the crapper, and they come up with an idea, and it's generally a stupid idea, right? Is this because they're on the crapper? <laughs> Probably. It's, it's, so it's a shit idea. It's a shit idea. And what do they do? They call a rich guy like me, and they say, hey, Mike, I got this great idea. And every rich guy that you know always goes to say, hey, send me a business plan. And I'll, I'll look at it. Nobody's got one, right? And, you know, and they don't have one because it's, it's dog shit. It's a dog shit idea that they didn't put on paper, they didn't organize. So then they're gonna go to the bank and the bank's not gonna give them any money. Just like I wouldn't give them any money. I'm like, I always ask the same thing, did the bank give you money? No, the bank wouldn't give them money. Well, why would I give you money? Or if I do, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. More expensive, but it'll be so punitive, they won't succeed. So cash is, I mean, I, I always hate that thing, cash is king, but if you, if you don't have the thing. So for me, when I started my business, like I said, I didn't have any cash. I had a customer. I had customer, I had, I had relationships. relationships. Yeah. Right. I had vendor relationship, sure. customer relationships. And I went and sat and put a business plan together. I didn't show it to anybody, but I wrote it down and I'm like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I can't cash flow this thing. So I need universal forest products. But unless my customers paid me early and I delayed paying my vendor, I mean, it's a dangerous game. It's Robin Peter to pay right. Paul. Right? Rick Hendrick, I read an article, Rick Hendrick. I don't know if you know this. He, I mean, he would talk about how he would go to the auction, write a check for vehicles. And he's like, I got 72 hours to sell these vehicles before I've the check clears. That, but that's, that's, that's exactly the way Rick it works, Hendrick, right? You know, you know that's, you know, uber successful Rick Hendrick. You know, that's a great article and it, it is a dangerous game. I mean, I get people all the time asking me, how do I start a business? I mean... Well, you can go borrow money from your uncle, your aunt, and go get mom's and dad's mortgage blow their money. and blow it. I mean, it's not the right thing. Like, yeah. the, so when, when everybody starts a business, they go to a family and friend. It's really a, a dangerous thing to do. Like, it ruins families because right. every business, most businesses fail to start. Mm-hmm. That's why these corporations. Exist. Two years or oh, I mean, yeah. if you're in a restaurant business, forget about right. it. It's yeah. like 90%. Yeah. So. So. 
long story short is um, the last thing I want to add to that is that, you know, our industry, the security industry, you know, I've seen so many people over the years and I was basically a sales guy that knew how to do sales, knew how to train people. Like I knew how to run a branch. I knew customer service and I had built up one of the top uh, offices in the country. Well, the top office in the country for this particular company called Protect America a uh, long time ago. But I knew the sales and I was really good at that. But to your point, when you get in business for yourself, there's all this other crap, workman's comp, workman's comp audits, all of a sudden you owe eight grand and you owe it this week. You know, just all this other stuff that comes into play that, that most people are not business people. It's I'm a contractor, I'm a sales guy, I knew how to sell. But I think that's the most important thing you know how to sell. You knew how to sell and you had relationships. Well, what happens what happens when you start a business? Like I always tell everybody, the best the best launching point to start a business is being a salesman, right? Uh -huh. You know, because you need customers and you could be the smartest some bitch. Yeah, but well, you can be smartest some bitch when you're working out of your garage. Like you can be an aerospace engineer because you got no customers. You're sitting in your garage going, "Man, they're doing it wrong. They're wrong. I'm the smartest guy in the room." Well, you're making 50 grand, you're working out of your garage, you got no business. So you need to start as a sales sales guy. But operationally is where it happens. Like I can't begin to tell you how much shit I didn't know. So I'm a sales guy. I mean, I'm salesman of the year. Yeah. I had $20 million of the business. I carved out 5 million bucks, told my wife I'd make a million bucks on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm scratching my head, man. Nobody's paying me. Why were they paying <laughs> me? <laughs> I mean, I'm Mike. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, I just stole this. These are somebody. my friends. <laughs> yeah. Like why? So I'd go to, I, I'd never forget his name was Wayne, Wayne Joyce. And uh, his, he owned a company called Joyce Frame, and I was selling him his plywood. Uh, and, he, and by the way, he was young too. He was 28. He bought it from his dad, but he grew up in the business. So he knew operations. So I said, hey, Wayne. He did the whole training. Yeah, yeah. I said, Wayne, you think you can pay for that truckload of plywood? Do you think you can give me a proof of delivery? I'm like, what's that? Whatever it is, I'll get it for you. And you can give me my 12000 Yeah, I, I'll get you to you today, <laughs> one way or another. I need that twelve k. We didn't have one, so we made one up, and we got our twelve grand because I was. He's like, man, this shit doesn't match what you got. I'm like, would you just please pay me because I got to pay payroll, right? You know what I mean? But you know, you learn along the way, and then today, I think being the smartest guy operator, the orders just come. Mm -hmm. So I started my business as a sales guy, not knowing how to operate. Today, I fancy myself as an operation. I learned operations, and then the orders just come. Yeah. I mean, that's where that's when you get on that side of it, and you're the best at what you do. That's when it gets fun. Similar trajectories. You know, it's, it's you learn the, the business and you learn operations and customer service and, you know, how to, how to work through the, the, the trouble issues. Um, so before we get off employees, if there was, if there was one or two things, because we both started off as employees, if there was one or two things that you would tell employees that this is where most employees are missing it, what, what would that be? For the average employee for my business you know i mean like i just always say you know bring your pail do what you're asked and then like what we do is we measure everybody and we we do we do a lot of lean where it's visual management so you know if you're running a cnc router it's corner me and all machine and you know it's supposed to be 80 sheets that day and it's 11 o'clock in the afternoon you should you have sheets, you so. should have 40 sheets at this time yeah. you have 37 sheets so we're, you know you're in the red so I come over and I ask him. I'm like, hey, hey, bro, you're in the red. Why are you in the red? Well, man, the, the forklift driver didn't get me my stuff on time. All right, I can, I can control all those things. But you know, I did pull out your time card. You came into work at 7.17. You clocked out three minutes early for break. You came back four minutes late at break. But if this is the forklift driver's not putting the wood on your saw, I'm going to solve that for you. That's 24 minutes. Yeah, well, I want him back. You've stolen from me. And then, but when you teach them to make money, you teach them this discipline. They come to work every day because they got a family to feed. But when you take an employee off the street, I actually look at it, it's not fair to them. So when you say, hey, what, what would you say to this employee? I would first look at the employer and say, hey, are you given all the tools to succeed? So if I'm an employee, I'm going to that boss and saying, hey, man, I want my plywood on the saw. You want me to hit 80 sheets? I want my plywood on the saw. I want my saw, like these saws take 15 minutes to start up. So if you're a, a guy comes in at seven o'clock at work and the maintenance guys didn't come at seven six forty five, and and soft start your machine, right. I'm pretty pissed. Right. So I'm, I say to employees, make sure you ask for what they promised you. Right. But when they give it to you, you better give them what they asked for. Right. 
So I usually take the employee side. Like, don't go to work. If that machine's not safe, don't go. If they don't give you the gloves. There's not proper guarding. Don't go. Right. But when I give it to you, it's go time, baby. So two principles out of that that, that I hear is if you got 80 sheets to produce, whatever those 80 sheets, sheets are in whatever industry, any, any widget, any function, any area of your responsibility, you make damn sure you hit your 80 sheets. And if you are being inhibited from hitting your 80 sheets, you communicate with management that these factors are starting to affect my ability to produce my 80 sheets. And if they're legit reasons, then that's on the company or the management to solve those issues. You know, I always say like, and this is, if there's employees watching this, and this is the best compliment I can give. So I have a facility in, in uh, Ripley, Mississippi, and it's, it's been it's been the bane of my <laughs> Is this the tornado? Yeah, I mean, it's in Tupelo, Mississippi. In the summer, when it's 100 degrees anywhere else, it's 120 there. When the winter hits and there's snow going to hit, this place is going to get hit. It doesn't really matter. Or if, the, if there's a tornado that's going to hit somewhere in the country, it's... It's your factory. <laughs> Mississippi. Inevitably, I have a manager. I've owned this place for 23 years. Inevitably, the management says, there's 100 employees. The manager says, you know, I'm like, hey, Mitch, Joe, Larry, whatever the hell your name is. They're like, the employees are bad. Worst employees in the free world. I'm like, so I always say the same thing. So I'm telling you, Mitch, I got to have 100 bad employees or I got one bad leader. It's easier to deal with the one bad leader than say these 100 employees are dog shit. Because the chances of these 100 bad employees versus one bad manager, not saying there's not some bad apples, but to defense of the average employee in America, they get up and try mm -hmm. to go to work every day and do a good job. Right. So as managers, we got to make sure they got the tools. Right. But when we give them the tools, then you got to be in a communist state. Right. That's why I tell my guys, they're like, Whoa, what do you mean a communist state? Were you a dictator? I'm like, no, I mean, I, the saw's safe. The wood's on it. Sitting there ready, to ready to go. The dust system's working. The air is good. It's go time, baby. Air conditioning's on. Air, air conditioning's, right. you know, it's Checks 80, it's 80 sheets. Right. And then we took it one step further. We said, what's, we met with all of our employees and we said, what's a man's wage or a girl's wage? You know, with our equipment, it's a lot of men. Uh, but by the way, another topic, but all the women that pull the parts are women. The, the ones that count, we use women for that because they're better. More detail. Oh my God. Yeah. It's not even close. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not even close. You know, so so for these dudes on my equipment, I'm like, I've given it all to you, bro. But what do you want to make in a day? He's like, I think I should make $20 an hour. I'm like, well, that's 160 bucks, eight hours, man. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of wage. What if I told you you can hit 80 sheets and when you hit it, I'll pay you 160 bucks. If you get in six hours, I'll give you 160 bucks. If you get in 10 hours, I'll give you 160 bucks. You talk about motivating the son of a bitch. So you're telling me, you, you know what they do? They skip their breaks, they skip their lunch. The whole narrative shifts. I'm not arguing about when you come back because now it's a capitalist situation. Right. It's 160 bucks, I can be here for six hours, or I can be here for eight hours. Choice. You know, everybody always asks me, Mr. Mike, Mr. Mike, what's it like to be rich? I'm like, same as you, bro. I go to work and try to be there on time. I go do my job, I come home, on my way home, I grab a six pack for the car ride home. I'm not drunk, it's just maybe an open container, but I get a, you know, get a nice couple cocktails in me before I go in the house and the wife's in my ass, my kids are in my ass. Granted, somebody else is driving. Grant, no, 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 I mean, I just started, you know what I mean? So I get home, I've, Mike have a drive. I'm a three, beer, three beers in and my wife and my kids want my time because they've been home fucking off all day. You know, now they want my time. So right. the only thing I'm doing is trying to get those kids to bed, trying to get some food in them, trying to trying to play with them, trying to be a decent dad, trying to get a little bit of ass before I go to bed. Chase mama down. Yeah, chase mama down. I get mama and I don't want to talk to her after that. And I just <laughs> want to watch my show in peace. I, I love her, but I just want to watch my show in peace. They're like, that's exactly what I'm doing, Mr. Mike. So what's the difference, Mr. Mike? If you're rich and I'm not rich, why are you doing this and I'm doing it? We're the same people. I'm like, we are the same. Now, the right. difference is I'm walking into my business that I own and I'm driving a Bentley there. My beer is probably Heineken on the way home. My wife's a dime. My kids, you know, my house is a, a multi-million dollar home. But in the middle of all of it, I'm just trying to get a piece of ass. We're the same, bro. We're, same guy. We're the same guy. You, you know, the thing is, the difference is the choices along the way. It's you made a choice to start your own company. They might make a choice to drive a nicer BMW, spend all their money, and 
enjoy the security of their position, whereas you had a bigger, you had the, the guts to take a chance and do something on your own. And so those are choices you made and they make their choices. Well, you know, I went We're left. I went left. They went right, but it doesn't mean they're bad folks. No, I'm. I'm just saying, like, like for anybody that has that victim narrative, it's like, I, I just decided instead of being a sales guy, and doing really well and running an office for some other business, I took the harder path and started a business. Well, that guy I told you about, my buddy growing up, that wanted to be a bond trader in New York, mm -hmm. and I went and go started my own business. Bill, people would always say, like, hey man, you know. Are you jealous of Mike? And Bill's made a million bucks a year. Yeah. You know, he's probably worth seven, eight million bucks. And you know, I might be worth a little bit more. Yeah. And and Bill would say, Man, I've watched that journey of Mike. To be that kind of money, it not, wasn't not the faint heart. It wasn't worth it. That's for sure. You know what I mean? So I, I think there's a home for everybody, you know. What I mean, I wouldn't trade where I'm at today, right. but I can tell you some dark days. Yeah, absolutely. And I've I've we've talked about some dark days. Uh, and I think, you know, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur or you're a business owner, I mean, it's all on you. You know, there's going to be times where you're responsible for everything, whether you, whether it was you directly or not, you're responsible for everything. No, no time to be an introvert, right? Yeah. You know I, mean, I mean, you gotta like, do what like, you gotta do. <laughs> that's what I tell my kids all the time. I'm like, yeah, we're all introverts, but you kids, if you want to win, you're going to have to start opening your mouth. You're going to have to talk. You're going to have to do all these things that make you uncomfortable, right. you know? So those are, I think, great lessons for employees. Um, and, and something else you said I want to uh, jump on as well is not everybody's cut out to be a business owner. That's okay. You can be a number one or a number two or a number five of an organization and do really well and be comfortable and have a salary. And you can invest in rental properties, crypto, like stocks. There's so many other things you can do to make it financially a different way. But don't demonize the business owner. You know, it's, it's uh, man, it's not as easy as it looks from the outside. Uh, and uh, that's why most businesses fail. Well, they, they fell because there's also family pressure, you know, like I'm, I'm on my third wife, you know, and I don't attribute it to being a bad, like putting my heart and soul in the business. But, you know, sometimes your passions are different, right? You know, I mean, everybody gets divorced to get all these things, you know, but for me, man, I, that business was number one and it is today too. And it's just the reality. I, I can, I can say the same thing, to be honest. Um, so that's employees and uh, jumping into if, if someone's listening to this podcast here and uh, they're thinking about starting a business and they're, they're at the very, let's say they're a bartender. Like we, we just met the, the person uh, as we were getting a little lubed up for the podcast here. Um, we met a, biz, a person and they're thinking about starting a business. What is some advice you would give to someone who's young and ambitious and, and uh, looking to start something? You know, uh, I'll tell you a quick little story. So when I started industrial timber, uh, my mom would say, Mike, you're, she calls me Mike. She actually calls me Oh Michael because my whole life I was in trouble. She's like, Oh Michael. So she'd say, Oh Michael, you know, like, weren't you lucky to get in the wood business? I'm like, Mom, I'm, I make frames in Northeast Mississippi, which is like the armpit of America. There's no luck here, you know? So I would say, like, if I got in the shitter business, I'd win. So, but the most important thing I would tell a young person is when you pick it, even if it's a shit field, stay in it and become an expert in that field. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had no interest in being in the wood business. I worked in a mobile home in the woods, but I was in it. Mm -hmm. You know how many people sitting there in their job and they're fantasizing about another job? Whatever you pick, go all in. See it through. See it through and be in, like, it would be insane for you to get out of the security business. Insane. Yeah. I agree. You've I'm spent sorry. a career in it. Right. So if I'm that, that bartender and I'm, I'm selling something shitty, like, like what's the shittiest sales job in America? Like a cell phone salesman. Security sales. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just something like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like you get out of college and they say, go sell knives. Like you're going to go like, door to life insurance. life insurance, something shitty like that. But if you choose it and they grabbed you at 24 years old and they put you in this shitty fucking career, stay in it. Because if you're smart, there's a bunch of stupid people in it and you can find a living in it. Well, you can be the top 10% of anything. Exactly. Yeah, so that would be my class. advice. Okay. I Don't think. sit there and draw on the whiteboard, I wanna be a nurse. You're a bartender at the Capitol Grill. Mm -hmm. 
You're not gonna become a nurse, it's five years from now. So pick something. Don't fantasize about being a veterinarian. You know how many girls grow up and they wanna be a veterinarian and become Mrs. Rook? You know what I mean? Pick something and be the best at it. The one thing I, I'd like to contribute to that is get into something you at least have a high level of enjoyment for. I don't enjoy everything I do at all, but, but I enjoy a good 80, 90% of what I do. Sales, you know, training people, crushing goals, waking up, being excited about, you know, building a brand. There's a lot about my business and I'm sure it's this way for you too. developing the relationships. I'm looking and, at and we're selling a porta potty coming and I've told my boys, I want to buy it. And they're like, why do you want to buy it? I'm like, man, that speaks to everything I am. Like, I do not want to, I didn't dream to be in the shitter business, mm -hmm. but I've been in the profit business. Right. And to make money on porta potties and sump pumping, mm -hmm. it's disgusting. I would love to be in that business. I would love to own that business. And when people say, what do you do? Man, I deal with shit all day, baby. <laughs> it's fucking cool. On a side note, did you know Chuck Norris failed in business? Well, I don't he, know. He created, he created a diaper, diaper business, business, but they wouldn't take shit from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if I'm going to put my two cents in there, I, I think you got to find something that you enjoy. For example, if I tried to be a bookkeeper, I would be miserable because I wouldn't enjoy it. When if I was playing poker, I yeah. Was, but here's what I'd say, Brian: If you're going to be a bookkeeper and that's your business, own all the bookkeepers. That's what I'm saying. Once you get in it. There's a, there's a silver lining in almost every, everybody says, oh man, you know, be a sports agent because you love sports. There's like four of them in the whole fucking country. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, well, this is why the conversation is good though. Be because, and I agree with you. So, so we're still on the same page. I just think if I was going to go into business for yourself, um, let's say you're an office manager and you're dealing with books and you're, you're, you kind of fucking hate what you do, right? Like, I don't know that I would want to go into that personally because if I don't like what I do, every day is a drudgery. And for example, if I could get paid to hang out with you, <laughs> I could work 18 hours a day because we you have know, a blast. But, but by the way, all three of my wives signed up for that job and they all gave up. Yeah, well. We talked about it. <laughs> But what I would say, Brian, if you were a bookkeeper and you've all of a sudden become a bookkeeper and you're three years into being a bookkeeper uh -huh. and you want to start your own business, you don't want to be a bookkeeper, you don't want to even be part of the bookkeeper business. You just invested three years in being a bookkeeper. Uh -huh. What I would recommend to that person is saying, hey, if you want to start a business, being the boss of a bunch of bookkeepers. That's a different scenario. That's a different angle to it. So you might have to be a badass bookkeeper for a while, but you start. But why give up that? No, I, can, I, can see I mean, why would you give up all those hours on that asset you've invested? And that's what I tell everybody. I'm like, just pick something. Just, I don't give a shit if what it is. Mm. Porta potties. Right. Go get five porta potties and go to a concert and say, hey, shit in my box. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, and start making some damn money. And right. then next thing you know, that weekend you're pulling the shit out and it sucks. Yeah. Like, you don't want to be a shit puller, right. but you don't mind managing 100 people that pull the shit. Right. If you're making a lot of money. So, so if you are going to start something you don't really love, at least love the growing of that business and the branding of it and that sort of thing. Um, so, so you're a young guy, a young girl, a young non-specific gender. Let's uh, get this podcast right for 2021. Um, and you're getting in business for yourself and you're going down the road. What are some of the things that, that you would recommend you know, it's a five things podcast technically, but we don't have to have five things. What, what are some of the things that you would say that, hey, y this guy is has started his business. What are some things you would, would mention to them? Oh, man, I think about that. So I can think about one mind. I mean, you know, for me, once you pick it, I mean, you got to pick something. I don't care what it is. Don't quit. Don't quit. Try. I don't care what it is. I mean, if you're you're selling Mary Kay and you you bought all the goods and you, these dumb girls have convinced you to pet ten thousand dollars on selling Mary Kay, you know you're just in the makeup business. Right. Mary Kay sucks. You ain't gonna sell that ten grand. And it's a pyramid scheme. It's all fucked. But now you're in the makeup business and you've learned the makeup business and they stole all your money for two years. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do I start selling makeup to these dumb girls that were buying Mary Kay? My own shit. 
And then if I can do it online, you know what I'm saying? Like, like once you're in it, pivot to a different pivot scenario. to something that can make you money, but don't get out of it. Like, I don't know how many young people I meet, they're all fantasizing about being something else. You know, like, it's like my first wife. She always wanted me to be something else. I'm like, man, I ran out of things to make you happy, baby. You know what I mean? Like, the only thing I can do is be like a drunk or a child molester. I don't know what else is going to make you happy. What I'm saying is I can't pivot to make you happy. So I'm going to stay who I am. So what I'm doing, if I'm a small, if young guy and I'm starting my own company, I'm just going to stay focused and committed. If you got out of the security business, I've known you for 15 years, I'd kick your ass if you got out of the security business. But you're fantasizing about maybe being a podcaster and, you know, you got to stay focused on what, who you are. You know what I mean? For me, I'm in the wood business, you know, and I'm in the operations business. So, so basically what you're saying is if you get it started, see it through, see it through. And I, I mean, I've just seen so many guys, men and girls, mostly guys that just keep trading. And inevitably their families even look at them and go, man, this guy can't commit. Yeah. Everybody, your whole, every person in life, you know how many times you, you meet, you've got somebody in your life where he's got the new idea. Uh, he's a loser, <laughs> he's absolutely loser. But if he stays committed and all of a sudden you got somebody selling surgical gloves, what a shit job. Mm-hmm. But he's selling more of them than anybody. And then he all of a sudden gets, gets a deal in Vietnam where he's making surgical gloves. Now he's the surgical glove king of the world. What a shitty business. Make it, probably making millions of dollars a year because he became the best at what he did or among the best. Tom Cruise had a movie with, called uh, Cocktail back in the day. And he uh-huh. asked about who makes the Google binder. Some assholes getting rich on that little plastic thing at the end of a fucking shoelace. Right. I wish I was him. But you know what? I'm in the wood business. I'm probably making more. <laughs> so once you start it stick with it see it through and get to the top of your game get get to the top 10 20 percent of your industry at least you know you got the Pareto rule 80 the 80 20 rule you know if you're going to be successful you need to be in the top 20 percent of what you're doing though those are the people that are going to make and just for people that don't understand the principle it's a universal principle it's if you took if you took everybody in Mike's organization, 20% of the people produce 80% of the results. You look at art, um, 20% of the people produce 80%. You look at, uh, you know, musicians, 20% of the music musicians create 80% of the, the, uh, the work, uh, that that's out there, the songs and so forth. So get to the top of what you're doing and what else would you, uh, obviously you're real big on, Look at at your financials. Well, but I, I actually would probably go a little different. You know, I mean, I'm on my third marriage, and um, you know, I would say my first two got compromised. So, you know, as a young person growing up, you know, how do you balance it all? So, like when I had my older children, as they grew up, I tried to teach them balance, which I didn't know. I think I know it today. I, I got a decent situation going on right now, but like for for a young person, you got to go all in. But you also don't want to ruin your personal life. Sure. And it's a delicate balance. It's, tough. it's yeah. delicate. Now, if, if I was talking to Brian and you asked me my opinion on something, I'd say, screw the family, go dig. But now I'm on this podcast. I want to be, I want to be like polite. You know, make sure you take care of the family along the way because the divorce has actually cut me in half twice. Yeah. So if you're just being a businessman, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing on that front. But, but uh, I mean, it, 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 listen. Being a business owner is far more demanding than you think it's ever going to be. Um, I got one. I just thought of something. Yeah. This is the best advice. Actually, I want this is my advice to a, a young entrepreneur. Right. Don't start number two. Don't start number two. The biggest mistake I ever made in my career is starting my second. That's my advice for this whole podcast. Whatever you do before you start number two, skin number one. And that would be my advice to you and Tom. Don't go to don't go to Charlotte until you kill Raleigh. Okay. Skin what you got in front of you. All right. So skin it today. I would say begin with the end in mind. Understand what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I would throw that in there. But uh, Mike, I know you got to get going here soon. But uh, I certainly appreciate you sharing with the the audience today and trying to help folks get ahead in life. It'd be, it'd be nice if we could go back and have a conversation with our 20 year old self, uh, cause we could save ourselves a lot of time, but that's kind of what we're trying to do here today. So. And I'll give you a closing thought on that. I started my company up 
and above my door, I put my integrity and never be questioned. I was 28 years old. I put it in big block letters. I showed my wife, showed my friends, my family. I took a picture. I was in my integrity will never be questioned, which is the same place I am today. But I'm 51 years old, and that was I was tw so it's 23 years ago. Same sign hangs above my doors today, but what was integrity then and integrity today is different. So I would tell the 28 year old Mike and the 28 year old millenniums out in America, whatever you think is right, you don't have a fucking clue, because Mike looks at it different today at 51 than I did at 50, 28. So that's the, my advice to everybody. That's almost one of those deep thoughts by Jack Handy. Yeah, I'm sincere. I'm sincere. I mean, all this integrity and all this, I'm not saying I have lack, lack integrity today, but whatever I stood for at 28 is not what I stand for at 51. But that same sign stands, sits above my door. My integrity would never be questioned. But I wonder if my 28-year-old self would sit there and look at my 51-year-old. The 51-year-old looks at my 28-year-old and I go, you fucking pussy. <laughs> That's a great closing argument. Thank you for joining us and sharing with the audience, Mike. And thank you for joining us for another Five Things Podcast. Until next time. Hello, this is Brian Smith, and thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more valuable content.